Hello, welcome. We're on to like number four. <laughs> I've been talking about this for four hours, I guess, technically. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> welcome to Monday Fun Day, where I'm talking about my world building. We're gonna talk about geography today. Thank you all for watching all my videos so far. Uh, basically, I'm gonna be talking about a webtoon that I have in kind of pre production. A lot of what I say could change in the future, but. This is basically where I'm at in my world building. And yeah, like I've talked a bit about the magic system. I've talked about a bit a bit about the magical races and then I got a little more in depth within the magical system. And that's kind of actually how I developed everything is kind of in the order we're talking here. So I, I don't know if that helps you or anything, <laughs> but yeah. So basically it is a world where there are 12 elements of magic. There are mages and then there are non-mages and everyone exists kind of on a scale between furry and elf and elf is more magical furry is less magical there we go we got it bing bang boom um today we're gonna talk about geography kingdoms history whatever what's important i guess to note is that every one of the 12 elements is kind of associated with a different deity. I don't know how much of this comes up, but I will very quickly tell you all of them. So the deities are the 12 stewards. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. They're the 12 stewards of the Lindworm, and they're responsible for the creation of the 12 elements, apparently. They were eaten by the Lindworm in the creation of the world, and their powers via the Lindworm were bestowed upon their descendants. That's kind of the lore that's happening. There was Fen, the Divine Steward, Thane, the Crystal Steward, Baird, the Arcane Steward, Hazel, the Hearth Steward, Aura, the Eventide st Steward, Ash, the Sylvan Steward, Omen, the Void Steward, Bright, the Lucent Steward, Wen, the Tempest Steward, uh, Rue, the Curse Steward, Stell, the Astral Steward, and Rend, the Rift Steward. So there we got all of them deities out of the way. I just think they might get referred to a lot in this. So let's start with the kingdoms. Let's go. Okay, so there is the kingdom that is kind of like the main one in the webtoon, and that is the Divine Kingdom of the Lindworm. So the Divine Kingdom is one of the most influential states in the world as it stands now. It's one of the oldest kingdoms in the world, originating along the central mountainous region, and has since become an expansive empire that encompasses most of the eastern yeah most of the eastern continent i don't know why i got stuck on that in recent years it's kind of begun a rapid expansion into the western lands it has strong relations with two states which are the duchy of thane and the duchy of hazel which we will talk about later uh, it is synonymous with the Lindworm orthodoxy. Shocking. Uh, the kingdom is very intolerant of other religious practices, uh, especially it's against all forms of witchcraft. Uh, recent conquest into Western territory has been very tumultuous, uh, with lots of growing pressure on newly seized populations to convert to the Lindworm Orthodoxy. The Divine Kingdom used to be incredibly adversarial with the Kingdom of Alaria, but the kingdoms became separated by a huge chasm uh, during this one big event. Both of them still hold contempt, but they are no longer able to engage with each other due to the treacherous nature of the chasm. Uh, that or they have to go through like arctic seas to get to each other and that's not happening <laughs> not anytime soon there are quite a few provinces in the kingdom of the lindworm i don't know how much i should get into the lindworm the kingdom of the lindworm is pretty big there's like like these are like um more medieval -y societies so there's not as many people as there are in the current world there's like about 9.5 million people in the divine kingdom yeah I, I mostly have like climate information currently on all of the different um provinces 
I guess I could very quickly. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe I'll get into like the I will get into the provinces if I develop them further. How about that? Let's just focus on the main stuff for now. Onward, I guess. Okay, so then there is the kingdom of Alaria, which I have mentioned before, just recently, in fact. So the kingdom of Alaria is a relatively isolated portion of the eastern continent. In its inception, Alaria was a nation of night elves, uh, drow, directly next to the day elves, which are the divine elves. Um, as Alaria grew eastward and the divine kingdom grew westward, there came the tension that we mentioned and the groups fought over claim to the crystal caves. Um, as the day elves and the night elves mixed, the tension became more ideological. Alarians worshipped the crystal while divine elves believed in the lindworm. And when tensions neared war, um, all was interrupted by the cataclysm that we mentioned where there was a splitting of the crystal cave and it severed the kingdoms forever. Olaria grew further eastward coming into contact with temple elves and rift elves. While the temple elves were like gladly accepted, the rift elves were not. I think I've mentioned this when I was talking about the different forms of elves. Olaria is predominantly gremlin in population. Uh, which is a unique distinction to Alaria. So like Alaria's far north region is home to many temple elves and common elves make up a large population of people throughout Alaria, especially along the eastern side and the eastern coast. Alaria, like as I mentioned previously, has a much broader term for common elf, which includes more fawn-like people, while like in the Lindworm Kingdom that's not really what an elf is considered to be. Alaria has like a considerable pop population of arcane elves as well, which are still considered common elves and not like orcs <laughs> to them. Other elven populations include like some sea elves as well as other elves that migrated before the division of the kingdoms. Alaria doesn't treat harpies well, in addition to not treating rift elves well, and raven harpies have traveled to Alaria. Uh, void gremlins and even tide gremlins are like nearly non-existent because like gremlins are like um, crystal elves, but they tend towards a little more animalistic. Um, than like drow and so they have like feathers and stuff and because there has been some mixing with like other harpies that have like like a small handful of other harpies may have made their way to the continent made some impact so there are technically like void gremlins and even tide gremlins but they're not just really uncommon and like nearly non-existent it's a little smaller like the, the kingdom of Valaria, there's like 6.5 million people living there, I think. Yeah, and there are provinces, but again, we will get into them one day. Okay, so Duchy of Thane is our next one. As mentioned, the Duchy of Thane is a sovereign nation that is connected to the kingdom of the Lindworm and is ultimately subordinate to it. It has a similar structure to the Duchy of Hazel, which we will get into as well, but hate but Thane is the older of the duchies. So the region um, that is now Thane was first a civilization of astral elves, and the kingdom that it initially was was founded by the wise king of Aether and Stars. Uh, the king believed himself to be a reincarnation of Thane. Relationships between Thane's kingdom and its neighbors were largely peaceful. Upon his death, the kingdom fell into the hands of his son. The economic and cultural power of the Divine Kingdom eventually led to the royal family of Thane relinquishing power. A large reason they did this uh, came through the way of like marital ties. In modern Thane, the royal family has lost crystal magic and they're all divine at this point. The Duchy of Thane quickly became a force for conver converting the Southwest into the Lindworm Orthodoxy. Uh, the Duchy of Thane like its allies, is working on the conversion of those in its 
eastern region more so. It has one last stronghold of Hazalian witchcraft going on there that they're working on. Um, and there's a large region of like generalized, more tolerated but still not loved Hazalian beliefs. These generalized beliefs have become have been like historically easy to envelop into like the orthodoxy and that's sort of how it is coming about. Hidden along like the icy coasts is actually a stronghold of like astral witches. There's been significant difficulty in reaching them because they're in kind of like a subarctic area. Um, these communities largely do not even consider themselves part of Thane. In recent years many of the younger generation have adopted some of the more orthodox beliefs and it's slowly eroding the northern traditions. Very cool, we love you Thane. In relation to that, like I said, there is also the Duchy of Hazel, which borders Thane and the Lindworm Kingdom, and again, it's very similar in structure. The Duchy of Hazel was originally disconnected from the Divine Kingdom. After the Centaur Wars, what a sense, um, the kingdom was worried about invasion. They handled things diplomatically. However, the kingdom, uh, the divine kingdom, left all of their religious practices intact and has only recently begun shifting the population towards the Lindworm. They're, they're doing the long play with them. Uh, public sentiment has greatly improved towards the divine kingdom over the years, uh, and this is largely due to the swift aid that was given to Hazel dealing with the um, the Plague of Lilies, which we mentioned before. Uh, the plague has been a wedge used to successfully cut down most practices of witchcraft. Many were especially heartened to see uh, the Divine King make a public appearance in Hazel during the efforts to stop the plague. Mythology surrounding the king and the queen kind of changed over time because of this too. Like it was initially thought that the king had a monstrous, had a, <laughs> that the queen of the kingdom was a hideous, terrifying monster beast. And after the plague of the lily where everyone was cursed and stuff, uh, they felt a lot more sympathetic to the king who's wife yes is a horrifying monster beast but because she was also she also <laughs> fell to a, a a horrible curse and it was a lot more relatable and sympathetic uh now as opposed to before where you could be like oh man monster whatever uh so that quashed a lot of earlier sentiments of the king being controlled by a demon monster queen and now he's just a relatable guy who also has dealt with witch curses. <laughs> um, let's talk about the West, guys. In the West, we have uh, the Fengrad Empire. So that's gonna be our orc empire, right? So Fengrad is the dominant force of the Western continent. Uh, Fengrad originated from the dynasty of Baird, which we will be talking about. And that was in a place that is now called Rinbend. Fengrad came to be when, through the use of divination, uh, the lord of a Bairdian province learned that the divine elves would destroy the world, and this was before any contact with the eastern elves even happened, so they learned of the concept of divine elves during this time. So after the establishment of the Moonwell Kingdom, which is a kingdom that was that wasn't orc. It's basically not an orc kingdom. We will get into Moonwell because there's so much going on in the western continent as well as the east, obviously. Um, so like, after the establishment of the Moonwell kingdom, fears of future elven invasion led to a strengthening of Fengrad. Um, since Fren Fengrad has expanded, uh, building like a strong military and defense against the Divine Kingdom, like that's kind of what's happening. Much of their military might has been used instead to expand territory in the name of unity. The original goal of Fengrad's founding have become less and less important as they have expanded. The current Empress um, has been rekindling fears of the Divine Kingdom. 
um, as it has been expanding closer to them and reaching the coast. Um, historically, Fengrad was stopped from expanding eastward due to Wensland, uh, which is an island nation between the continents, and Wensland has remained neutral through all of this and just doesn't want to be caught in the middle of warring BS. Uh, um, the mountain ranges have- there's mountain ranges to the west of Fengrad, and they have largely been a force in preventing an expansion westward into some other nations that are there. However, there is currently a conflict occurring with the um, the nation of Dranius, which we will get into, but there is like a mountain pass where there is disputed territory going on. Um, and as for Moonwell, which still exists to this day, there is a tenuous relationship with them, but there is a relationship, so at least we got that. So let's just let's just talk about Baird, because that was the first one. So the dynasty of Baird. So the dynasty of Baird is a land controlled by a dynast believed to be a direct descendant of Baird. So one of the stewards, the arcane steward. As in old Baird worship, a religious practice, uh, the, dyn the dynasty regards Baird to be a god above the stewards and not really like a steward himself. Uh, Baird is the oldest nation on the continent, however Baird was pushed away from its uh, original lands. It's no longer where it used to be. Uh, much of northern Fengrad was originally part of Baird, from the provinces of the Fen wetlands to the winding coasts. Some prov provincial knowledge that we will one day learn. All of Moonwell was originally part of Baird before the conquest of the Rift Elves. So we're gonna get some Rift Elf knowledge, and that's kind of all there is to Baird at this current time. Uh, let's talk about Moonwell, right? Like, that seems to be the one. Let's talk about all these, like, East, uh, Western continent stuff. East, West, so much. <laughs> okay, so Moonwell, right? Uh, sometimes referred to as the Land of Portals is a nation of Rift Elves, specifically Rift Mages. Moonwell was founded after they were expelled from Alaria. So if you remember, Alaria didn't like the Rift Elves, so the Rift Elves are able to make portals. So due to persecution, many of the Rift Elves fled uh, and were killed. Moonwell's first king was a powerful bandit mage who helped his people escape and reunite in a new land. Uh, the bandit king uh, gave up his many spoils to help his people, and the Moonwell Kingdom gained prominence due to the establishment of a new portal network that happened. Uh, in modern time, many important cities across the world, excluding Alaria, that's why this is part of the reason why Alaria is so like cut off from the entire world, is because they they weren't really nice to the Rift Elves and they don't really have access to portals because of this. Yeah, so Moonwell is economically kind of a powerhouse, right? It um, facilitates most travel and trade throughout the world, like a predominant amount of it because of their control over portals, which is very powerful to have. Uh, Rift Elves from all over the world are welcome in Moonwell. If you are a Rift Elf, you automatically are a citizen of Moonwell. And of course, in the very early years, that was like an influx of mass immigration, which caused the Moonwell Kingdom to expand into uh, what was then the Baird dynasty. Relationships have become less tense, though. There is still some animosity towards Moonwell, but there it, there's more peace nowadays. Then we've got Dranius, and Dranius is a federation of nations, so it's not a kingdom, guys. Dranius unified for the purpose of defense against Fengrad and Baird. So a range of mountain mountains shelter Dranius on all sides. Uh, while the government divides regions, there are many like cultural similarities that unite all of them. The Federation of Dranius also was important 
in developing like a trade network between all these smaller nations. Uh, Dranius is majority like just orcs. Uh, there's some vulture harpies as well as like a population of ogres. But like basically, it was just all these little cultures and civilizations that unified to protect themselves because they were like stronger as a unit. And there's a bunch of and I guess they know that if like the mountain passes fall, like they're all kind of fucked. Don't tell YouTube I said that word. So then there's Blood Bark, which is similar to Draenius, but it is a non-unified uh, part of the world. Blood Bark has not unified. It's just kind of a territory that encompasses a vast array of people. There's like nomadic tribes, villages, and like city-states. Blood Bark is kind of reflective of Draenius before its unification. Uh, because Bloodbark is cut off by a mountain range and mostly inhabited by trolls and vulture harpies, it's not quite there. It's kind of it's kind of like um, it's so off that often its own little distant section that it's not really dealt with all of that. And though it looks large, it's a lot of just frozen wasteland kind of stuff going on there. Just trolls vibin and it is considered to be the least aether dense part of the entire world hence all the trolls living there uh and then i think the last the last western territory uh is ravencrest and it is it is similar to bloodbark in that it is a territory the cold regions of the world and as its name suggests, it is the ancestral land of raven harpies. <laughs> um, in modern times, however, it's mainly a land of common orcs. It's still where the ravens live, uh, but there is a very large population of orcs that live there. Most in Ravencrest is focused on the worship of Void regardless, but there are also orc traditions from those that escaped Fengrad over the mountain ranges. Raven Harpies mostly get along well with orcs and they make their home that make their homes in Ravencrest. As many northern harpies engage in migrations, the addition of like orc society along their routes has made for like easier trips and trade opportunities and it's kind of the there's kind of like a foundation of like mutual respect for the land void and raven traditions, you know, like the orcs are just happy to have escaped Fengrad, basically. Right, what else we got? <laughs> now we got like um a bunch, we're gonna kind of go back to the west, or the east. We're gonna go back to the east. There's some we miss, some that are like similar, I guess. Okay, let's talk about this. We'll talk about the Sylvan Forest. Okay, so Sylvan Forest, we're going back to the east. Uh, it's the northern half of it. So the Sylvan Forest is like a united region similar to kind of Draenius where it's like a region of fawns. Uh, a large portion of the western Sylvan Forest was lost due to the inception and spread of um, the religious group that's the Sylvan followers of the Lindworm and through the marriage of like fawn practices and Lindworm orthodoxy, the kingdom has been able to like break apart many united nations. It's everything's kind of in flux, right? Um, what exists now of the forest is very unstable, uh, with one of the last like robust groups of witches in the North Forest being understandably opposed to the expansion of the Divine Kingdom. A vast division exists between Hearth Elves and Fawns, uh, and those and those like Sylvan in origin, with its success in converting like the Hearth regions to the Divine Kingdom, it's slowly having more sway with that population. So tensions kind of reached an all-time high after the kingdom had so this is like recently like current book current webtoon the divine kingdom has everything is very tense because recently the divine kingdom had its bloody conquest of the druid lands i think i mentioned when we were talking about forest elves though like they weren't allied entirely with the sylvan nation the sylvan fawn that live in the forest obviously see 
this as a threat. Hearth elves believe instead that the attack on the druids was justified because of the plague of lilies that happened and like due to like the uncontrolled nature of the plague many like divine fawn were also affected by the plague due to the high frequency of like hooved fawn and like obviously like those that ended up being saved by the efforts of like the divine kingdom in like the abjuration of like the plague and whatever like that's definitely endeared um endeared the deer and like other fawn as opposed to like the sylvan fawn and basically all of this is to say like the sylvan forest is like united but it's basically not and they're verging on like civil war yeah <laughs> I, I forgot about the sylvan forest i don't know how but Everything else, I think, is just all over the place. I think, yeah, we only have islands left. We have three islands to get through. Okay, so one nation we got mentioned before is the neutral territory between the continents. That is Wensland. So due to its position and powers of the mages. Oh, right, because Wensland is full of tempest mages, right, who can control storms and stuff. And basically, because of that, they exist between the two continents and they can kind of decide who crosses and who doesn't. So yeah, they can capsize boats and they can cause tsunamis. And like, you just don't want to mess with Wensland. So it's kind of been like a stop point between the two regions. And like, obviously, like the people of like Wensland don't want naval warfare either because they live in the ocean, right? Like some of them are mermaids. They don't want war on their turf. <laughs> yeah. They just don't want to be in the middle of that. So they use their powers. And yeah. Wensland, like, itself is actually really hard to reach because of all of this. And a lot of people, like, imagine it to be kind of like a paradise. Because no one can reach it because, like, they don't really let people come there. Sea elves. Let's go. <laughs> I don't have much to say about that. Uh, Lichland. Lichland is kind of similar to this, except no one wants to go to Lichland because it's terrible. Lichland is full of spiders and conflict and turmoil and curse mages. So though it is a very bountiful island, n there's not really much interest in trading with it because it's feral. There's a lot of issues. And finally, okay, let's talk about Elder Haven. So Elder Haven is a little northern island off the coasts of Valaria. Uh, Elder Haven is an island nation known for its vast collection of knowledge. Uh, divination is highly valued as a skill there. So Elder Haven has uncovered many secrets of magic and was established by the Lucent Mages. Um, and they have slowly gathered the strongest of each element mages to view stuff or whatever they use their power to protect the island through like illusion or whatever and also like all of their understanding of magic entrance to it is impossible without being like allowed to enter it has like great archives of magic mages of great power like i said are often allowed to live and study in elder haven however they're not allowed to form families on the island because they don't want dynasties and all of that like no one's really established there in that kind of way aside from like um non-mages who do live within elder haven and have are kind of like the native populations there but yeah no one can no powerful crazy strong mage is allowed to like uh establish shop there and live there all good you know, it's a monk life, I guess, is what I'm saying. Uh, many secrets of magic also cannot leave the island, and, like, you forget them as soon as you leave the island. So outside of the mages, like I said, there there are temple elves that live there. Some lovely sheep people. We love them. And that's all. That's all we got, guys. I know this wasn't short, but it still feels very short. Yeah, there's so many languages. There's so much going on. I don't know. I don't think I have anything else to talk about, guys. Um, let me know if there's more you want to know. I think before I get back into this, I want to 
because there's like some portions of this that I haven't even read out myself. There's like um, religion, like I've mentioned some of it, but I haven't fully fleshed out all of them yet. Like I've fleshed out a lot of them, but yeah, I want to flesh that out before I talk about it. And then there's like provin provinces within these nations that I could theoretically talk about. They all have cool names because I was doing some conlanging. <laughs> Which is constructed languages. I was making up some languages. Just just like naming languages, basically. Thank you for watching. I, I am enjoying talking about this. It's lovely. You guys are lovely. Thank you. Uh, see you in the next one. Goodbye.